Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We are amazed, aren't we? Man, that he'd love us in spite of who we are and what we do and what we don't do. Amen. He still keeps on loving us and showing us his grace and his mercy. Good to see you this morning in the house of the Lord as we come together to share his word and learn more about him. I don't know if you heard the news about the Pope. Pope was going to give a a speech to the United Nations. And so he flew in from Rome, arrived in the United States, and the plane was late, and he had to make up time because the UN had him specifically to speak at a certain time. So he got in the limo and told that limo driver, you need to make up about 20 minutes time, step on it. He said, look, I can't risk another ticket or I'll lose my job. So the Pope said, here, I got an idea. You get in the back and I'll drive because I don't have any tickets because I never drive anywhere. So the Pope gets in the front, the limo driver gets in the back, and boy, the Pope heads out 90 miles an hour, breaking every traffic violation, running every red light, running on the side, running in between cars, causing pedestrians to run off on the side. He was just breaking, and every cop began to chase him. And he had six cop cars, lights flashing, and man, the Pope pulls up right in there in the front of the U.N., and boy, the cops surround him before they can do anything. One patrol officer, they're both in a car, and he said, you go get that guy, and you throw the book at him, you write every ticket you can. So young patrol officer goes up there and has a guy roll down the window, and he talks to him and everything. He comes back to the patrol car a little later, and the guy said, how many tickets you give him? He said, I didn't give him any. He said, why? He said, he's just too important. He said, more important than the mayor? Oh, Absolutely. More important than the governor? Absolutely. More important than the president of the United States? Absolutely. Well, who on earth was he? Patrol officer says, I have no idea, but the Pope is his limo driver. (laughs) This guy's important. You know, it tells us how we misjudge people. Amen? We have our own mindset of what's going on, and that's not what's going on. You know, we have a problem many times in judging other people and judging situations based on our own preconceived notions. So this morning, the title of the message is The Fault of Fault Finding. Because there is fault in fault finding. Another word is judgment. We wrongly judge or we self-righteously judge somebody else when we shouldn't. And Jesus spoke about this in Matthew 7. We'll look at a few notes here. First of all is the repercussions. Jesus begins this by talking about the repercussions before he even discusses anything else and says, Do not judge so that you will not be judged. Now this is not saying to not judge at all. Jesus is not saying that. He's talking about a little more specifically later. But you have to make judgments. How would you know who to marry, where to go to college, what car to buy, you know, where to make this investment, where not to make this investment, where to, you know, you have to make judgments all the time. Uh, or you, if you didn't make judgments, you wouldn't make any good decisions at all. So Jesus is not talking about that. There's even the chapter after what we finish is going to talk about making a judgment call. So that's not what he's saying. You have to make judgment. But don't be self-righteous in your judgment is what Jesus is going to be speaking of here. And that's where he begins here about talking about that because when you're self-righteous in your judgment, guess who you're playing? God. God is the only one who can really, truly, righteously judge somebody else. And so when we look at this passage, we've got to be able to look at why is this so important? Why is there so much caution given by Jesus in this passage? You better not judge or you're going to be judged. I mean, that's a pretty serious statement there for us to look at. So why so much caution here? Why is this so important for Jesus to make these type of statements in this type of way? Well, first of all, number one, no person knows all the facts, circumstances, and motives of another person. When I judge you, I don't know all your circumstances of why you did what you just did that may have affected me. I don't know your motive. I don't know all the facts. Only you know that. But what we do is we jump to a conclusion is here's what you meant by what you did. Here's why you did what you did. Here's, 
you know, you were so wrong and I can't believe you did that. We, we immediately jump on them, but no person knows all those facts except God or the person that you judge. That's why Jesus said it. I believe another reason he said it is our flesh and our past experiences make it very difficult to judge somebody completely in an impartial way because we got our flesh, that's our nature that wants what we want and we tend to make people look how we want them to look or how it'll make us feel better. And also, when we look at that, we have our past. Oh, all people like that are like that. Why? Because you had some experience in the past where one person that did that was like this. All men are like this. All women are like this. All car salesmen are like this. Or all this are like that. We have all these preconceived notions based on our what? Past. And we look at a lot, which we shouldn't. We look at a lot of our past to make decisions in our future as far as how we see people. Our past so messes up our present, we don't have a future. Let me write that down. That came out pretty good. I didn't really, I didn't have that, I didn't have that in my notes, but... Uh, you know, that's what it is. You know, you're, I don't know I can say it again. You know, our past so messes up our present, we don't have a good future. We're, we're always letting it dictate who we are or what we've done in the past to say. And so that clouds our good judgment because how we did it. You say, well, I know. I know what they meant. And I know what they said. And I know how they should act. Oh, you're the judge, huh? You don't think people have misjudged? You know, there was a young girl that was in drama school and the drama teacher said, out of here. You're no good in drama. You're too shy to put your best foot forward. You know who that girl was? Lucille Ball. Do you know the Lucille Ball show was voted by America from the time TV began, which was black and white. Yes, there was black and white TV, kids. From black and white TV till today, the number one show in America was voted the Lucille Ball show. You're no good. You can't do drama. Wow, what a misjudgment. A group came to audition for a music uh, recording studio. You're no good. And matter of fact, you're no good. Guitar music's on the way out. You know the name of the group? The Beatles. A little bit of misjudgment there. Young ball player said, you're cut from the team. You're no good in basketball. He went home and cried. His name, Michael Jordan. You're cut from the team. You're no good in basketball. Guy was in the newspaper, worked for the newspaper. They said, you're fired. You have no creativity. You have no original ideas. His name, Walt Disney. No creativity, no original ideas. You're fired. A little bit of misjudgment. Young boy was sent home from the teacher with a note. Take him out of school. He is too stupid to learn. Name Thomas Edison. Well, praise God, he was too stupid that we have some lights now to look at what we do in the auditorium. That's pretty stupid. People always are making misjudgment calls on other people. You say, well, I'm glad those people did because I don't. There's a misjudgment right there. <laughs> You're still already misjudging. God, how many misjudgments do we make on other people? how much better our life would be if we began to think the best and not the worst. You know, the Jewish rabbi said there were six things that added credit to a man's life. You know what one of those six things in those Jewish rabbis were? To think the best of other people. But you know what our flesh does? You act like you don't know. We think the worst. That's what our flesh does. I know, if you said that or did that, you jump to the worst conclusion, not the best. And we're to think the best of others, not the worst. And then, of course, Jesus says this. One reason we ought to be very cautious because you and I are going to be judged. Go ahead and do it. But you'll face the consequences that he just mentioned. Why is why you mean judge? You know, why? Because God's the only judge. And if you play God... That's a dangerous place to play. Have no other gods before me except for me. That's what we're saying about ourselves. I will be God. Well, no, you can't have any other gods. No, I'll be God because I can judge the right way other people. Matter of fact, the Persians took this very seriously. There was a Persian judge under, under King Cambyses. 
And, and this Persian judge began to take bribes so that he would make decisions based on who paid him the highest bribe and so he would misjudge based on the bribe. The king found out about it and had him executed and then did something else. Fillet his skin off his body and reupholster that judge's chair with his skin. And so they did it. So that future judges that sat in that chair had a little bit of reminder what would happen to them if they misjudged and took a bribe. That'll make you judge right, won't it? So, oh, ugh, you know, I see, this guy's gonna give me a bribe. No, I'm gonna judge righteously. Uh, this guy needs to, I think, go this way. I know that guy. No, I think I'll judge righteously. That'll give you a motive. This ought to give us a motive. Judge not lest you be judged as we judge other people. The Bible says that to receive mercy, we're to give mercy. So if you're going to be so harsh on them, just not to have any mercy on them, say that's what they are and that's what they did, and I'm going to turn in there and I'm going to run. Then okay, let's have that kind of mercy not shown towards you by God. You're going to set that kind of standard? Maybe that standard will be returned to you because Jesus talks about the rate of return. And what is the rate of return? Jesus mentions that. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. So you're going to hold them on that high standard? See, Jesus, that's his... God has a high standard. We're talking about ourself, our self-righteous judgment. Not the Bible telling us what to do. What we're telling other people in the sense of our judgment toward them, I'm going to hold you to a higher standard. So you're saying you want to be held to that higher standard. And I hope this happens to you because you're doing that. You want that to happen to you when you do that? Because we judge them. We tell them stuff like this. Or we, we say it in our mind if we don't tell them. I can't believe you forgot that. And you've never forgot anything before? I can't believe you didn't acknowledge me. And you've never forgot to acknowledge somebody? Oh, I can't believe you asked me to do that. And you've never asked somebody to do that? I can't believe you didn't listen to me when I was talking. And you've never not listened to somebody when they weren't talking? You know, that'll make you feel a lot better about yourself when you get upset with somebody at work or at school or whatever. Just walk away when you're about to they can light a match on your forehead. Why don't you just say, you know what? Have I ever done that? And you'll probably walk away saying, I did. So don't get so mad at them. You've done that before. Show them a little mercy. Like you hope somebody that you did that to would show you a little mercy. That doesn't mean don't go to a brother that's in sin. That doesn't mean go help somebody that's sinning and try to help them. We're not talking about helping them. We're talking about judging them. There's a whole different statement here. Because you know what? We have 20-20 vision when it comes to everybody else's faults. Boy, we can see them good. We see everybody's good. 20-20. But we're almost blind sometimes to our own. You know, we don't see our own. But we're kind of the visions, well, I don't even know what the number is. You just barely can see them. You just can't see your own, but you can see everybody else's. But if we were honest, what we're seeing in everybody else's is a good reflection many times of what you have wrong in your life. Oh no, I'm judging them. That's probably what you got wrong. You ever notice that the thing that makes you upset, the most upset as a parent, when a child does something wrong, it's the thing that they have that they're doing that's most like you. Hello? <laughs> that's why you're as upset. I remember one time we were, uh, Rebecca and Hannah and I were tubing on the Frio and I had to go get some tubes and I got two that were real good, I thought we could just use two, maybe kind of 
do that, but that wasn't going to work out. So I was one short. And these were nice tubes. I mean, rental tubes and everything. It's like, oh, we're a third short. What are we going to do? We're... And this lady on the bank, she kind of heard us talking, and she had one of these Walmart or dollar store 399ers. I mean, it looked bad. It was, you know, the real thin rubber that would, if it got cut, it wouldn't take much to cut it. And, and it was already about half low of air. So I thought, yeah, I guess we'll take it. Well, you know who got that one? There's no question who got that. And I got that one as they got the Cadillac tubes and off we go. And, and Hannah, you know how she's a smiler and a laugher. You know, we started hearing this <laughs> as we're as I'm on it and we're going down the river and she was laughing like nobody's business. Dad, look at your, your, your tube's leaking. You're not even gonna make it halfway to So I'm sitting there smiling, nodding, trying to laugh as well. Yeah, that's real funny, you know. We're sitting there going down. Let's, let's hurry this tube trip along, you know. And we're going down and then we break apart and I kind of break this way and Rebecca breaks this way. And guess what? I heard the noise stop. <laughs> and Rebecca heard the noise stop. It was Hannah's tube. <laughs> Hers was the one leaking all along when she was laughing at my tube going down. You know, and it dawned on me. You know, that's what this is really talking about. Oh, look at you. Your spiritual tube's leaking. You're doing wrong. And you start breaking away and looking at your own life, that's probably more you. It's you. It's me. I'm the one that's really, and if I'll break away and begin to examine things, I may be the one that's most at fault here. That thing that I'm seeing in others is a good mirror of what's in me. And if I find myself judging some situation so harshly, so intently, so self-righteously, the Lord's saying, uh-huh, young man, that's you. There's your little mirror right there. And I get under conviction and say, man, that's, that's why I'm seeing that so harshly. That's, that's me doing that. The, the air spouts coming out of me, not somebody else. You know, even Ecclesiastes says this, also do not take seriously all the words which are spoken so that you will not hear your servant cursing you. For you also have realized that you likewise have cursed, have cursed many, have, have many times cursed others. Now, he's not saying cursing's wrong, a right. It's wrong. But what he's saying is, he's so judging his servant for cursing, but he hadn't realized he's done it before. Why are you judging that other person so much? You're just as guilty. But we can be so hard on other people, which we don't want them to be hard on us in that same measure of judgment. You know, a lot of times what comes into play is what I call the boomerang effect. You know, I thought I probably wouldn't have to explain this, but... Young people, you know, a lot of them doing the games, they may not know what a boomerang is. You know, that's an outside activity. <laughs> you know, a boomerang is this device that we had as kids, which I didn't get to work very good, but you're supposed to throw it in the air. If you throw it a certain way, then it comes all the way out there and the thing comes back. You better either duck or catch it because it's coming back fast as you threw it. And I don't know how that works, but it works. And here, what I believe is happening is that part of that measurement, part of that judgment is, you throw it out hard, you better watch out, some stuff's coming back. Part of the judgment, I think, is what comes back, that we throw out. You know, one of the people in the Bible is, is, is Haman. I don't know if you read the book of Esther, but Haman's a pretty wicked dude. You know, he, he, he's second in the kingdom next to the king. Nobody's higher up than he is. He's been promoted to number two. But he hates this Jewish man named Mordecai. Mordecai. And, and Mordecai, what he hates most is when he walks by, and Mordecai doesn't, the Bible says, tremble when he walks by. Because he wants so much honor. Because he's number two. He just gets so mad at Mordecai, he wants to kill him. Matter of fact, he builds a gallow to have him hung on. He's already had it built. He had authority to have it built, but it sounds like he needs the king's authority, I guess, to go ahead and carry out the execution. So he thinks, the next morning, I'm gonna go to the king's palace and I'm gonna get permission to hang Mordecai on the gallows that I've already had made. Little does he know, the king can't sleep that night. 
And the king asked, because he can't sleep, bring the chronicles in. No, that weren't the Houston chronicles, but that was the chronicles of all the historic things that happened. So the, his assistant there began to read from the chronicles. And they came across a passage where Mordecai was written down in their history portion that he had reported a plot of murder against the king and he reported it and the king's life was saved. So the king says, what do we do for this guy? You know, what do we do to honor him for doing that? The guy says, well, it doesn't show here we did anything. Nothing? I mean, this guy did a noble deed, Mordecai. No. He said, well, I need to talk to somebody. Is there anybody in the courts? He said, well, Haman, Haman just showed up. He's out there. Of course, he's out there wanting to tell the king, let's kill Mordecai. I got the gallows ready. The same guy that the king wants to honor. So Haman comes in. Before Haman could tell the king what he wanted, the king says, hey, Haman, I got a question for you. How should the king honor somebody that they desire to honor? And the scripture says, Haman thought, He's talking about me. He's wanting to honor me, I bet. He was thinking it was himself that the king was referring to. And so Haman says, well, you ought to give him a, one of your robes, one of the king's robes, and put it on him, and then put him on one of the king's horses with the royal crest on the horse and have one of your noble princes uh, escort him through the square and uh, parade him around saying, thus shall happen to the person who the king desires to honor. Well, that's a good idea. So Haman, won't you go get the horse? He said, yes. And won't you go get the robe? And won't you go do that for Mordecai? And you are the one that'll escort him around. Oh, I could say, I just love, just love to see that picture, that face when he, he never got around to asking, let me have him killed. And so don't you know how humiliating that was. Oh, here goes the king, the one, the one, the one. we can't hear you. And thus shall be done to the one that the king desires to honor. We can't hear you. Thus shall be done to the one the king desires to honor. Oh, that was humiliating. And not only that, the story ends where the gallows were used and they were used to hang Haman, not Mordecai. Mordecai was uplifted in the kingdom. Haman was hung by the king. See, that little boomerang effect kind of works, doesn't it? The thing that we want for others sometimes swings right back to us and we see the problem. The other is being a false witness. The Bible says if a witness is a false witness in court, he has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him just as he intended to do to his brother. Uh-oh. What he brought the brother into court for and wanted to have happen to him, if you find out he reported it falsely, he judged falsely, then you do to him what he wanted to do to his brother. That's some boomerang judgment right there. We could go on and on. There's just not enough time to list them all. Adoni Bezak. How'd you like to have that name? But Adoni Bezek fled and they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and big toes. And Adoni Bezek said, 70 kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to gather up scraps under my table. As I have done, God has repaid me. I had 70 kings toes and thumbs cut off as judgment. And now that they've caught me, then that's what I deserve because I did it to them. They ought to do that to me. I'm being repaid for what I did. That boomerang just comes right back. And we see that a lot in life, I believe. If we would stop and think of how much stuff has boomeranged back on us that we should have never thrown out as far as judging other people harshly. Yes, it's the grace of God, but there's still benefit or there's still consequences to judging like God has, asked, has commanded us here not to judge. And then the last part is the resolution, which Jesus gives. He says, why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your 
your own eye. You know, you're looking over there at your brother, sister, friend, neighbor, and you say, I can't believe you got that speck in your eye. And you've got a big log, big thing they just cut out of the forest. This big timber that you're hanging from your head. And you're noticing a speck in somebody else, a piece of dust in somebody else's eye. Now, a piece of speck's not good to have in your eye. I mean, we're not saying the other person doesn't have something. I mean, you don't even want to have a speck in your eye. I mean, it's not right to have a speck in your eye. But it's wrong for you to have a log in your eye trying to help somebody else with a speck. That, that, that doesn't add up. And Jesus says clearly that we shouldn't do that. You know, Galatians says, Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you that are spiritual... Restore such a one with the spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too do not be tempted. Now what do you have to do to be able to go to a brother that's sinning? Judge them that they're sinning. How do you know they're sinning? Well, I have to make a judgment call. It looks like they're in sin. Okay, that's okay. But before you go to them and offer any kind of advice or counsel, you better look at yourself and say, you know what, I've probably done that, thought of that, I could easily fall into that. So you, if you do that, now you're going to go in a spirit of gentleness and, instead of before you say, I can't believe you did that, you sinner. Don't you know you're a Christian? No, you'll be going, man, brother, that's wrong. And man, I've been there. I've, I've thought of that. Or man, I'd, I'd fall except for the grace of God myself. But let me help bring you to restoration. Let's see what we can do to help you and bring you back into the fold and minister to you, I'll minister to you because I can because I've either fallen there or thought of falling there or by the grace of God not and God help me, give me strength not to. See the difference? That's not self-righteous judgment. That's judging yourself and seeing how wicked we are so that we can help other people in sin. That's the way God wants us to do. That's the way he wants us to see it because he goes on to say this. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye and behold, the log is in your own. In other words, how can you do that? You, know, you, can't, you can't even see to help them. Why? Because you're so blinded by your log, you can't get that speck out. You can't even see the speck because of the judgment. You know, the, one of the world's most distinguished astronomers in the 1800s was Sir Percival Loyal. He was unquestioned in his astronomy. And he always believed there was life on Mars, more intelligent life than humans and, and all that. And he read where another astronomer had said he saw, out of his telescope, he saw canals and channels and river type things and Mars, which Percival Lowell thought, well, there you go right there, that's evidence. And so he began to look in his big telescope in Arizona and he began to map out all the rivers, canals, streams on Mars. And he was never questioned that all that was correct. Well, today, we know that's a lie. We've got telescopes, Hubble telescopes. I mean, we can go up there and see a little small rock. And so we know that that's not true. There are no canals, there are no channels, there are no rivers, there's no life on Mars. So what did he do? Well, Percival Lowell, they look, and looking back at his life, there was two explanations. One, because of his belief that he thought life was on Mars, he believed he was seeing canals and channels because he wanted to. A lot of times we see things wrong in other people's life because we want to. Because we want to get even. And we don't like what they did, and they did us wrong, and we want to get even, or we want the argument to go our side, and we'll see stuff that we want to see. Because if you look hard enough on any of our lives, you'll see fault. You don't have to get out the binoculars to see fault in any of us. But what happens is sometimes we get the binoculars going on spouses, on friends, or church members, or relatives, on parents, on children, on whatever, and we get those microscopes out, and we begin to see stuff, and you'll find it. But who said you should be looking that hard? He wanted, I believe, to see it. The other deal is they said he had a rare eye disease that caused him to see the bulged veins in his own eyeballs. 
There's a disease at that. Your eyeball veins get so swollen that when you look straining through a microscope, you can see your own eyeballs. And so that's what he was doing. He was mapping the veins of his eyeballs on his paper. You know, today that's called Lowell Syndrome after Sir Percival Loyal. He saw what was really his own eyeball. Do you know that's what really happens? The Lord brings that to my recollection. If I begin to look at somebody too harshly, the Lord's saying, you, you know what you're seeing right there? You're seeing yourself. Why don't you go correct that? Oh, I can't. That's you. That's you. You're seeing your own eyeballs. And isn't it unusual, I mean, isn't it neat that the Lord uses the same illustration about the eye of which we perceive all information visually that we receive visually is, is filtered through the eyeball. And that's where we get, you know, through our ears and through our eyes. That's how we take it. And we find out that he was wrong. And Jesus said, you hypocrite. That's what judging wrong really ends up being. Hypocrisy. Why don't you first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Use that time that you're so upset with so many people or so many, won't you just stop, get in your quiet time and say, God, please show me me. Be like that tax collector beating on his chest and saying, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner, except for that Pharisee. It says, boy, I do a lot of religious things. I'm glad I'm not like him. <laughs> Self-righteous judgment. Instead of saying, oh God, show me me, and I won't be that harsh judging everybody else. No, we don't want to do that because God's going to show us us. <laughs> and we may not want to see all us because it'll take repentance and change, and a renewed life, and a fervor, and a new spark on life, and great things ahead. And the devil wants to keep us from that, from looking at our own life, and looking at others too harshly. Charles Swindoll, many of you know, great speaker, preacher. He was asked to lead a conference, a camp in California. So he flew out and, to do that uh, conference there. And he said on the opening day, it was going to be a week-long camp. People from all over the United States had came in to, to hear him speak. And one of the gentlemen approached him there in the lobby before they ever began and shook his hand and said, Dr. Swindoll, it's such an honor to finally meet you face to face. He said, I flew out here from such and such, and I can't wait to hear what you're going to have to say. I got my notepad. I'm ready. This is going to be great. And he shook his hand. I'm thank you for those kind words. And and it greeted some other people out in the lobby. And then the conference started. And Swindoll said, there was that guy on that front row. Boy, he was ready to go. And he said, during his preaching, he began to nod off. I know none of you have done that. But, you know, he's, you know, he started to nod off a little bit. Well, Swindoll thought, God, the guy flew from wherever. It's a long day travel. You know, hey, he's tired. No big deal. The next day, same thing. Sleep a little bit. Up for some back down for some and up, sleeping through most of it and then back up to here. You know, well, maybe he's still a little more jet lagged. You know, next night, same thing. Next night, every night, same thing, going to sleep on his. And I don't know about you, that doesn't make you feel very good as a pastor or preacher because in Swindoll, it ate him up. He thought, man, I, pray, I prayed so much about this. I prepared, I studied, looked at the Greek. I put all this together. Put this, I put a lot of work into this. And this guy's down there sleeping for him to even come here and sleep during my messages. He just kind of lit Swindoll's fire. And so conference was over and he was out in the lobby and began to meet people and whatever, and here comes this lady up. And she shook his hand. Dr. Swindoll, this has been great, man. She said, I just want to thank you so much. You've been such a blessing to my husband. He has cancer, and he only has a couple of weeks to live. And I asked him, what do you want to do? the last two weeks of your life. He said, I want to go hear Chuck Swindoll preach. That's how I want to, that's all I want to do. That's on my bucket list, just that. So we flew out here 
But Dr. Swindoll, I want to apologize to you for him sleeping during those messages. They give him such high, powerful pain medicine to keep that pain from that cancer down that it just knocks him out. And I just want to apologize to you for him dozing off during those uh, sermons. But then she went on to say this, but I want you to know that you made this the best week of the last part of his life. Swindoll said, I felt like climbing under a rock. I just wanted to erase myself. How I had misjudged him and how all he wanted to do was come hear me. How many times have we done that? We've misjudged someone. We don't know. They may have just lost their parent. They may have had a bad day at work. They could have had all kind of stuff, but we don't see all that. We just see what we see. And we misjudge people all the time. Carry around guilt. Carry around bitterness. And we don't even know the whole situation. But we want everybody to know the whole situation on us. Oh, I was tired. I was forgetful. I had a long day. Yes, but what about them? Well, they didn't. How do you know? How do I know? How can I be that much of a judge to them? You see that why that destroys friendships, churches, and marriages? Because we are the judge. Well, who made you judge? I don't see your robe. I don't see my robe. God has his holy robe. He'll be the judge. Thank you very much. He'll take care of all that. I don't, and I have not been called to be the self-righteous judge, and neither have you. See, the things we have to be careful for is one, Righteously judging other people. That's number one. Number two, not judging ourself. If we judged ourself, it'd be a good thing. But that's the last person we want to judge is us. No, we need to do that. We say, God, they haven't done as wrong to me as I know I've probably done to other people, especially to you. God, help me not to be this way. I need to be loving and forgiving and gracious and merciful because that's how you are, God. Let me be that way. You know, the third person I believe that people judge wrongly is God. You know how they, people wrongly judge God? Well, God's okay with this and God's this away and God is this away and I believe God is this away. If this isn't the way you believe God is, you're wrong. You have misjudged God. Oh, he's okay if I do this, and he's okay if I don't do that, and I don't have to be faithful here, and I don't need to go to church, and I don't need to pray, and I don't need to, I don't need to do that, because that's what God is, and he's okay with it. You and I have misjudged God. Of course, we're in no position to judge God anyway, but he is who he says he is, and he does what he says he is, and he's upset with what he's upset about, and his law says what his law does, and his law accomplished what his law accomplished, whether I believe it or not. But if I begin to misjudge even God on how he is, I've judged unrighteously. A lot of times people, even in salvation, won't judge themselves. Because see, if we judge ourselves and we look at our life and say, you know what, I'm a pretty good person. I've never robbed any banks or never killed anybody. But I look in God's word and he says the only way to heaven is to be perfect. Jesus himself said, be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. So I'm going to step back and I'm going to judge my life. Yes, I'm a pretty good person, but I'm not perfect. So therefore, if I'm not perfect, I'm not going to go to heaven because only perfect people go to heaven. So I've got a problem. I'm going to judge myself right now before I get judged in heaven because I'm going to be found guilty. So how in the world do I make myself perfect? Well, you need and I need a perfect Savior. Because when I get a perfect Savior, Jesus Christ, He forgives me, I give Him my sin, He gives me my righteousness, and therefore I can stand before God perfect in His sight. Amen. But if you never judge yourself, amen. But if you and I never stop to judge ourselves, guess when our first judgment will be that way? Before God. And God has to be the one to say, you're not perfect. Well, I never knew I had to be perfect. Well, Brother Strickland said that. He read it out of my word. Be perfect of my Father in heaven is perfect. You say, how on earth could I be perfect? He said, receive the perfect Savior into your life. Make Him your Savior and Lord. Commit your life to Him. Turn from your wicked ways and receive Christ as your Savior. And follow Him the rest of your life. Receive Him. Then you'll obtain perfectness. But it all starts with what? Salvation started with us judging ourselves. And a good walk 
in a blessed walk, in a happy walk, in marriage, in relationships, in church, always begins with us judging ourselves, not everybody else. Because bitter people, unforgiving people, miserable people begin to just judge more and judge more and judge more and judge more and judge more, and it becomes a, a wall to other people. So what will it be? First of all, if you've never come to know Christ, judge yourself and see. See if you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you need to. Because one thing that the Bible never promises is a tomorrow. Only a today. Only a now. Now is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Number two, is there anything in my life, in your life, that God may not be pleased with? Say, you know what, I, I need to make this right. Whether it's right with somebody else, right between you and the Lord, why delay? Make that right today. Maybe some people have never come to know Christ. You've never judged yourself that way. You've got to make that decision today as well to say, hey, I need Christ as my Savior and Lord. You can make that as well. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you stand to your feet,